And here we go. NFL Divisional Round Playoffs, College Football National Championship. It's arguably the best football weekend of the year, so let's make some cash. Welcome back to Tomlin's Tips, the 2020 NFL Divisional Round Edition. I'm back as your host, Michael Tomlin, and hopefully we have much better sound quality now that I'm back home and not at a hotel. As always, this podcast is brought to you by Fantasy Six Pack, an industry leader in fantasy football and gambling content. Be sure to check out my weekly picks column where I pick my best bets for both college and pro football each week throughout the season. We are already working at an early mock draft for the 2020 fantasy football season, so stay tuned and be sure to check it out. Okay, so let's get to the elephant in the room. I did not have a good week last week. My best bets were 0-2, I went 1-3 across all four games, and both my over-under bet and 10-point teaser loss. But look, it happens. If I went 3-1 every single week, then I would just move to Vegas betting millions on each game. We are just trying to surpass that break-even point, make a small profit while having fun and getting invested in these games. As I always do, the first part of my research is looking back at where I went wrong. Did I completely miss something, or did the ball just not bounce my way? Was Where was the team undervalued, and where was that team same, same team overrated? Or was it just a combination of factors? The last one is what I ended up on. Last week was the first wildcard round in 28 years where all four games were decided by a single score. Hell, two of the four games ended in overtime, and the other two ended on a fourth down stop and a pick six. These were the definition of coin flip games. Either team could have won each of the four games had just a single play gone differently late in the game. Whether it was the 15-yard penalty on Buffalo when they were driving for the winning score, the Julian Edelman and Miles Sanders' blatant drops on third down, or the Breeze fumble, each team, each losing team, has to be kicking themselves that they gave it away. And I'm not trying to take anything away from the winning teams or make excuses for my losses. I'm just trying to find a way to better my handicapping going forward. So after sifting through mountains of data and research, I found that I did not factor in strength of schedule enough. Usually this statistic is a college football staple and not in the NFL realm as much. However, there was a a statistical oddity this season that exploited the strength of schedule. The NFC and AFC East divisions were two of the worst divisions in recent memory. They combined to have four of the five worst teams in the league. They played each other in non-conference and interconference play. They also got to play the next worst division in each conference in the North divisions. This led to eight teams in the East divisions combining for eight of the nine worst strength to schedule ratings in the league. This also led to inflated records from their three playoff teams. So with the three games involving teams in these two divisions, there were drastic differences in strength of schedule rankings. Houston had the seventh hardest schedule in that category, while Buffalo was 28th. New England was next to last in strength of schedule, and Tennessee was 21st. Philadelphia had the 29th hardest schedule, while Seattle played the hardest schedule. So how can we apply these differences? First, there has to be a drastic difference. In these cases, we have rankings differences of 21 and 28 spots, while the fact that the Titans were an average strength to schedule and the Patriots were next to last magnifies that 10-spot difference. Then, if the game is seen as a coin flip or either-or type battle, the difference comes into play. By game time, all of these spreads were 4 or less, and in retrospect, the New England spread would have been less than 4 if their name wasn't New England. On that note, a quick aside on how strength to schedule needs to be factored factored in even during the season. In the Patriots' first eight games, they did not play a passing offense that ranked in the top 17 that had its starting quarterback. That boosted their statistics to otherworldly levels and had people talking 85 Bears or 2,000 Ravens. However, when you look deeper at the numbers, they gave up about 42 yards less per game to teams than their passing average, over the whole season, that is. If you take out games against backup quarterbacks, that number goes to 28 yards less per game. If you look at just games against top 17 passing offenses, so above average basically, that number goes to 16 yards less per game. Then if you take out that Dallas game where it was played in an absolute monsoon and downpour and, you know, the bogus tripping calls, New England actually gave up more passing yards per game to above average passing opponents. Think about that. We were talking about them like they might be the greatest defense ever when really they were just beating up small, terrible teams with bad quarterbacks and getting lucky on defensive returns. The numbers are similar with total offense as well. 
My point is that strength of schedule can really have an impact, and for fantasy purposes, we should keep a more in-depth tracker on it, but I digress. My theory for handicapping using strength of schedule is that at the end of the game, in a tight contest, this difference in opposition throughout the year will win out. We saw it as the Texans were able to rally and hold off the Bills after going down 16-0 late in the third quarter. We also saw it with the way Seattle held firm in the fourth quarter against Philly, although some of that can be attributed to backup quarterback Josh McCown. Then we saw the Patriots basically choke because they had been beating up terrible teams all year and did not know how to come from behind. There is one spot this week where I will bet this theory. So let's get to the actual games and dig out some winners. I'll cover all four NFL playoff games again, as well as the college football playoff national championship at the end of the pod. First game of the weekend, we have the six-seeded Minnesota Vikings traveling to the top-seeded 13-3 San Francisco 49ers. Game's at 335 Central on Saturday. Current line is San Francisco by 7 with a total of 44. The Vikings were able to drive down in overtime to overcome a furious Saints comeback and win 26-20. Two things about that ending, though. One, that was a push-off and should have at least been reviewed. What's the point of video review on pass interference if it is not used in the biggest of circumstances? Two, we have to do something about these 0-2 rules. That the, a higher seed does not get to touch the ball in overtime, why not just play a full 10 or 15 minute quarter? And if it's still tied, go to, go to the current setup. Nevertheless, the Vikings were able to run all over the Saints and control the game, clock, line of scrimmage. The biggest factor, though, was a team that turned the ball only eight times, turned over the ball eight times over a 16-game season, turned it over twice in one game, leading to a direct 10-point swing of a game that went to overtime. That, my friends, is how you lose a game. Minnesota is now 3-7 and seven against the spread after a straight-up win and 6-0 and against the spread after a straight-up loss. I think this is good coaching right to ship better after a loss. Mike Zimmer is a great coach as far as motivation and getting his team ready to play. He actually is the best all-time coach against the spread. He's even better when you factor in against non-divisional opponents, which this game was as well as last week was as well as this week. However, I think that kind of motivation and just getting your team up and ready comes in better after a loss and it does a win and the numbers show. San Francisco comes into the game 3-2 and two against current playoff teams. However, they are 4-5 and five against the spread in their last nine games since their 7-0 and start. I think there's been a premium placed on them, even though they didn't play a playoff team until Week 9. Their own schedule was front-loaded, but there's still just a neg- negligible difference in overall strength of schedule between the two teams. Eight of the last ten San Francisco games have been overs, as their defense got a little overrated from their early season success, However, it is still one of the best units in the league. Minnesota hadn't been an underdog of more than three points all season. However, this is the third straight week they will be in such a circumstance. They were a five-and-a-half point dog against the Bears. They were a seven-and-a-half point dog last week at the Saints. And now that number's kind of going between seven and seven-and-a-half, but I'm going to go with seven because that's what I saw this morning. Both of these teams have really good pass rushes, as San Francisco is third in the league per pro football focus, and Minnesota is eighth. But neither one of them actually protects the quarterback at a high rate. San Francisco is 19th per pro football focus, and Minnesota is 25th. I think some of this might have to do that neither quarterback is much of a runner, so they might take a few more sacks and hits than, say, Lamar Jackson or, uh, or Deshaun Watson. The Vikings were able to run all over New Orleans and relied on a quicker passing game, but I'm not sure they will be able to do that same game plan against the number two ranked defense of San Francisco. Another big discrepancy is San Francisco was fourth in the league in third down offense at a 45% conversion rate, while Minnesota was 19th in stopping third downs. New Orleans was not able to sustain long drives, but I think San Francisco will against the Vikings. They have that three-headed running back attack, and their offensive line is just playing better than New Orleans has. San Francisco is 6th in time of possession, while Minnesota is 22nd. And San Francisco is 5th in yards per play at 6.0 yards for every play, and tops the league in opponent's yard per play, giving up 4.7 yards per play. I know it might sound like a broken record, but the long drives of San Francisco will force Kirk Cousins into riskier throws than he had last week, and the better San Francisco defense takes advantage. A stat I heard from the... RJ Bell Dream Podcast, 
Kirk Cousins is the best quarterback in the history of football against the spread at noon on Sunday. He is the worst quarterback in the history of football against the spread of anyone that started 30 games or more in any other time slot. This game is not noon on Saturday. Give me the Niners minus 7. Next game, Saturday evening, we have the six-seeded Tennessee Titans traveling to the number one-seeded 14-2 Baltimore Ravens. Game time, 7-15 Central Saturday night. Current line is Baltimore by 9.5 with a 47-point total. Just 12 months ago, who would have thought that Ryan Tannehill would possibly be the quarterback to end the Brady-Belichick dynasty? I know it's hard to say it's completely dead until one of them is not with the team anymore, but still, the fact that Ryan Tannehill, former Dolphin, who they always destroyed, could be the one to do it is quite shocking. With that said, New England still had an 85% chance to win the game per FBI when they got that first and goal up 10-7 late in the second quarter, facing the second worst red zone defense in the league. Instead, questionable play calling led to it. <coughs> Excuse me. Led to a field goal. It's too much time remaining in the quarter for the Titans to come back and take a 14 to 13 halftime lead. I think if New England goes up 10 there, that might have been too much for Tannehill to overcome. I mean, Tennessee had 150 yards on two drives, 122 yards on seven other drives. There were still two massive bounces that went Tennessee's way late in the fourth quarter. Edelman dropped that key third down pass near midfield that would have led to a game winning field goal. And the last punt of the game rolled down to exactly the one-yard line because Belichick decided not to have a returner. Nevertheless, the Titans made the plays they had to to win the game. Since Tannehill took over, Tennessee is now 4-1 against the spread and straight up on the road. Baltimore, on the other hand, has won 12 straight since a two-game losing streak early in the year. They've also covered 9 of 10 games. The only loss against the spread was actually a three-point win over the top-seeded San Francisco 49ers in the NFC, and they were a 5.5 favorite. So the only time they haven't covered in almost three months was to the NFC number one seed in a game that they won outright. That's pretty ridiculous. Baltimore covered those nine games by 163 points, or almost 18 points per game. That's not winning. That is covering the spread by 18 points a game. So if the spread was seven, that means they're winning by 25. They're on absolute tear. The one thing against the Ravens, they were just 2-4 and four against the spread as a home favorite, which might be even more shocking that they weren't favored in two of their home games. Both of these teams had subpar pass rushing this year, but Baltimore was a number one pass blocking unit in the league per pro football focus. Once again, some of this is due to Lamar being able to take off the first sign of pressure. However, they do have a very good offensive line. Oddly, four of the worst six pass rushing teams in the are are alive in the final eight of the playoffs. Both teams are elite on offense, Baltimore second, Tennessee third, and special teams, Baltimore second, Tennessee sixth, all of these stats per pro football focus. They also have about equal strength of schedule, so no real advantage there. I feel like I have to go back to two factors that I mentioned last week regarding Tennessee, their red zone defense and sack percentage. Baltimore was second in the league in red zone offensive scoring touchdowns, scoring Punching it in the end zone 67.19% of the time, while Tennessee is 30th in the league, allowing touchdowns 66% of the time. So two-thirds of the time, both of these teams either score a touchdown or give it up in their respective sides. Baltimore is near league average in sack rate percentage at 6.37%, but Tennessee is still dead last in sack, in sack allowed percentage at 10.94%. New England was not able to get to Tannehill, but that was due to just 16 dropbacks being called by Tennessee because of Derrick Henry's efficiency. I think the game script took out the New England pass rush because Derrick Henry was running well and they got that early lead in the first half. Baltimore is much better against the run, 15th per pro football focus, and can run the ball even better than Tennessee, third while Tennessee was fifth, and Baltimore had the top time of possession in the league. Similar to the last game, Baltimore will be able to sustain long drives, third in yards per play at 6.1, that always end in points. They were first in the league in points per play at .499 points per play and second in the league in red zone offense. This will naturally be a higher scoring, higher position game than last week, which favors the more balanced offense of Baltimore. If there's more possessions, that means there's going to be probably more scoring, meaning Derrick Henry can't just take it over. 
He's also had 32-plus carries in back-to-back weeks. At some point, this will take a toll, and he will not be as effective. I think it's this week. Give me the Ravens, minus 9.5. Sunday's games, the first one of the day, we have the fourth-seeded Houston Texans traveling to the number 2 seed, 12-4 and four Kansas City Chiefs. Game time, 205 Central. Current line is 10 and a total of 50. My one winner last week even felt like a loser, as many didn't get the bills until they were plus three or even plus two and a half when I took them at plus three and a half earlier in the week. The bills even had a 96.7 chance to win the game outright per FPI when they went up 16-0 late in the third quarter. They also had an 84.4% chance to win in overtime before the 15-yard blindside block penalty. Side note, blindside block is the hardest call to make as an official, and it is showing with the discrepancies of when it is called. Trust me, I I am a high school football official, and adding this to our plate was not something we wanted. Anyway, the Bills were even able to convert 11 of 21 third downs and half of their red zone trips, just like we thought might happen. However, Deshaun Watson was able to pull it out in the end. They better not get out to such a slow start this week because the high-powered Chiefs will get up more points and will let up less with a much more experienced head coach and the best football player on the planet in Pat Mahomes. This is the only rematch of the weekend as Houston won in Kansas City 31-24. In that game, Kansas City had gotten out to a 17-3 lead before a 20-point second quarter outburst from Houston. And then Kansas City retook the lead before a late fourth quarter touchdown by Houston and a five-minute plus drive sealed it. Since Mahomes came back from his injury after the first game, he, Kansas City is 6-0 and straight up and against the spread. Their only loss in the last eight games was that crazy Tennessee game where they botched three different kicks within the game that could have won it. They've covered their last six games by 58 points or almost 10 points a game. Just like that Raven stat, they're not winning by 10 points. They're beating the spread by 10 points a game. The, Houston is the biggest dog they've been all year. However, Watson had gone years back to high school without losing by more than a single score. Now, their last three losses are all by two touchdowns or more. Right off the bat, as if the high, highest total of the, total of the playoffs didn't give it away, but you know there will be scoring. Per Pro Football Focus, these are two of the top 12 offenses and two of the worst 10 defenses. Both are in top 10 in protecting the passer and bottom third in pass rush. Kansas City is fourth in allowing sacks, and Houston is 29th in sacking the quarterback. All this will lead into less sacks, longer drives, more scoring. A matchup I like is the Kansas City receivers against the Houston DBs. Kansas City was 8th in the league at receivers per pro football focus, and Houston was 24th at coverage. However, Kansas City had the 4th worst run defense, and Houston surprisingly had the 4th best run offense per pro football focus. We don't think of Carlos Hyde and Duke Johnson as the, these massive runners, but they were efficient enough, and with Deshaun Watson's ability, Houston does have a solid rushing attack. What makes the Kansas City drive sustainability even stronger is they are first in the league in third down percentage at 47.59%, and Houston is next to last in allowing third down conversions at 48.88%. Kansas City is, yard, is second in yards per play at 6.2, while Houston is third worst in opponents per play at 6.0. All in all, I expect this to be the highest scoring game of the weekend, and the over is my best totals bet of the week. However, when it comes to the spread, I think the line has just crept up a little too high. As we saw last week, the comeback potential of Deshaun Watson is nothing to be overlooked. They'll be able to get some points on the Chiefs' defense, and if they somehow got the lead, they might even be able to win the game, as we saw in the first meeting. I think the Chiefs will win, but Houston will cover the 10. Lastly, we have the fifth-seeded Seattle Seahawks heading to Lambeau to take on the second-seeded 13-3 Green Bay Packers. Game time's 5.40 Central on Sunday. The line is currently 4.5 with a 46.5 over or under. There are some 4s out there as well, but this is where having multiple outs is your best bet so that you can find which line fits your pick. I don't feel like I missed on my Eagles pick that much last week. They went down another couple of key contributors, including starting quarterback Carson Wentz, after he took a vicious, dirty hit that knocked him out early in the game. So with a backup quarterback, they were still able to have a fourth down attempt deep in Seattle territory at the end of the game to tie it, or at least with a cover. The game went like I thought it could, as the Eagles completely stuffed the Seahawks running game. They only had 64 yards and 26 attempts. 
However, the injuries were just too much to overcome, and DK Metcalf had an absolute breakout game. Still, Miles Sanders dropped a rail route that, might have, that he might have scored on it. Changed it, it would have changed everything. After the win, Seattle is still just 2-3 and three straight up and 1-4 and four against the spread in their last five games. Both of those straight-up wins were over backup quarterbacks, and there was also a two-touchdown loss to Arizona in that five-game stretch. They're 3-3 three and three now against playoff teams, but even more imp- impressive, they're 7-2 and two on the road against the spread. The Packers come in off of winning five straight and going 3-2 and two against the spread. However, their offense has been stagnant. They haven't scored more than they've only scored more than 24 points just once since October. They have hit eight straight unders, depending on the number you got against the Giants. The reason for that is their defense has given up 30 points just twice all season, and they were three and two against other playoff teams. As I noted last week, Seattle is not good at protecting the quarterback or getting to them, as they are ranked 30th by Pro Football Focus in pass, pass blocking and pass rush. Green Bay is 4th and 5th in those categories, respectively. Green Bay is also 7th in run blocking, while Seattle is 28th in tackling, which was a problem last week for them as well. Shockingly, both teams were outgained on a yard-per-play basis, and Seattle actually had a better net than the Packers. Seattle was also better at 3rd down conversions on both offense and defense, which is a bigger factor in close games between two teams that have not been scoring that much. Here's where I've learned something from last week. There is a drastic difference in strength of schedule discrepancy here. Green Bay is the only non-East Division team that is in the bottom nine of strength of schedule, ranking 25th. Seattle's played the hardest schedule in the league this year. When you combine those factors, mixed with the closest spread by far of the four games, I am leaning toward taking Seattle at getting four and a half points. So my best bets would be Baltimore, at nine, giving nine and a half, San Francisco giving seven, the Texans catching ten points, and the Seahawks getting four and a half. For my ten point teaser of the week, I'm starting with the Ravens to win the game outright. They've been the best team in the league for months, and I think Tennessee's run ends here. I also like Houston getting 20. Deshaun Watson and DeAndre Hopkins will be able to keep Houston within three touchdowns in that matchup. In their previous blowouts, they had the tendency to wave the white flag, but that's not going to happen in the playoffs. They'll play to the last whistle. I'll also go over 40 points in that one. So Baltimore minus a half point, Houston plus 20, and over 40 in the Texans-Chiefs game. Another over-under to look at is that under in the Packers-Seahawks game is that's going to be a slow knockout dogfight, and there might be some weather. Lastly, I want to give a quick breakdown of pick in the college football playoff national championship. The spread is currently LSU by 5.5, and, and the over-under is 69.5. Both teams come into the game at 14-0. and 0. LSU is a sparkling 9-5 and 5 against the spread, while Clemson's 11-3. and 3. Clemson's number is even more impressive when you factor in that two last-second meaningless scores and huge spreads kept them from being 13-1 and 1 against the spread. However, all anyone can talk about is that one against North Carolina where they squeaked out, one, squeaked out a win on the road. In retrospect, though, losing on, or barely winning on the road against a bowl team that has a national championship winning coach is not that bad of a win. I don't know why people think it was a loss. Well, that and the fact that Clemson, quote, hasn't played anybody, even though they've beaten 12, 12 Power 5 teams, 8 bowl teams, and 2 SEC teams. However, the one common opponent with LSU is Texas A&M. Clemson won by two touchdowns at home, but was really three until they gave up that last second meaningless touchdown, while LSU blew them out 50 to 7. That could be the AM, that was one of AM's last games, and they were just they were done after playing five of the top ten teams in the country. Still, Clemson has covered five straight and had only one spread less than 24 points on the whole season. They've given up 17 report 17 points or less in 12 of their 14 games. They've given up 10 or less eight times, and they do lead the, the country in scoring defense. LSU has covered three straight games, and get, but has given up 20 points or more eight different times. They have scored 42 or more, though, 11 times, and 36 or more in all but one game this season. Clemson games went over six times, but all six of those overs had Clemson scoring 52 or more, covering the total by themselves four times. LSU was nine overs to five unders, but four overs and one under if the total was 64 or higher, like in this game. 
The only time they did not cover a total that high was when they held Utah State to just six points, which I don't think anyone thinks they'll do to Clemson. Offensively, these two are closer than you think. LSU was second in yards per play, while Clemson was fourth. LSU was second in points per play, and Clemson was third. Clemson's defense was much better, finishing second and first in yards and points per play, respectively, while LSU was 25th and 27th in those categories. I think some of this can be attributed to the harder, harder schedule, but Clemson's defense is markedly better than LSU's. LSU, though, was significantly better on both third downs, fourth in the league at 50% to 15th for Clemson, and in the red zone, fourth in the country for LSU at 96.49 scoring percentage, while Clemson was 31st. I may have some recency bias, but I just can't get away from the strength of schedule discrepancy. LSU played the 8th hardest schedule in the country, country, while Clemson played the 56th. LSU beat 3 of the top 10 teams by the Sagarin ratings and 7 of the top 30. Clemson only beat 1 and 2 of those categories respectively. As hard as it is to pick against a team that's won 29 straight in 72 of their last 76 games, I think this is just LSU's year. Give me the Heisman winner Joe Burrow and the Tigers at minus 5.5 minus 5 and take the over as well. That's it for another edition of Tomlin's Tips. Be sure to check out the website and the article. And if you have any gambling-related questions, shoot them at me on Twitter at Tomlin3.